Japan, a destination that's been on my bucket list for as long as I can remember. With months of planning and tips and hacks from local friends, I've managed to create a fully immersive experience to take you through this unique country, where every moment is a masterpiece. From truly hidden gems to the most iconic landmarks, mouth-watering food, rich culture, and let's face it, some shocking moments, I take you on an adventure of a lifetime through this unfiltered guide. First stop, Tokyo. Well, the journey starts in a very hectic and busy Tokyo with my local friend, Veronica. We actually met back home in France in our building. We became really good friends and then she left me to move back to Tokyo. So I'm really happy and excited that she'll be showing us around, showing us the top hidden gems, the most touristy spots, as well as stuff that you may not have heard of before. So let's get started. We're gonna explore this area. We're gonna make it to the famous Shibuya Crossing with a lot of really nice surprises along the way. So stick around. This is gonna be a dynamic start to Tokyo and you don't wanna miss this. The famous Takeshita Street in Harajuku is where this tour begins. Usually it's known for cosplay and wacky fashion, but in this case, this is so crowded. I expected more costumes, like more cosplay and stuff. But maybe I've been looking at Instagram too much. Maybe the reality is just a really, really crowded street. So this is not something that locals do. No, we okay. avoid this. Even though I wasn't the biggest fan of Takeshita Street, I definitely felt more at home in Omatesando, a modern area perfectly combining eclectic shopping with high-end residential complexes. You live in this area. Is this considered a high paying area? Are the rents higher here than in other areas? For a regular Japanese um, person, living here is pretty high end. What is the average a person would pay for rent and how big of an apartment would they get? 30 square meters and rent around this area, 3,000 euros. You know, all those videos and pictures that you see of Japan having very, very tiny spaces and tiny apartments. It turns out that that is actually true because 30 square meters is considered a luxury compared to some other spaces that you get. Veronica recommended a donut place, so we got here and check this out. This is the line, I'm not even joking. All of that is to get some donuts. We decided to go to the bakery next door. Not only do we have an empty bakery with donuts that look just as good, but we've also got transparent soda cans. Now, this is something I've never seen before. Next, onto the Shibuya Crossing, the world's busiest pedestrian crossing with over 2,000 people crossing per green light. As we approach the famous Shibuya Scramble Crossing, I've got a question. Mm -hmm. Is it a self-fulfilling prophecy? Like, is it so crowded because people know that it's crowded, so they come there, hence making it crowded? In my opinion, I would agree, yes. It's a very popular touristy place. It looks more overwhelming than it actually is when you're crossing, but seeing it is really, really impressive because you realize just how condensed Tokyo is when it comes to its 40 million person population. I understand why it's famous and I think that during the nighttime, which is the next time we'll come back here later on today, it's gonna be even more spectacular. So here at Miyashita Park, there's one of my favorite, absolute best ice cream in Tokyo. It's so creamy. Oh my gosh. Oh, it's milky. Isn't that good? Wow, this is like the plain milky vanilla. We've got a chocolate version and a cone as well. I'm very faithful to my flavor, so vanilla for me. I don't care, I just want ice cream. <laughs> Miyashita Park is also known for its rooftop terrace where locals can gather to socialize or practice their skateboarding skills. Oh my god, so we are going in the tiniest alleyway. The name of this teeny tiny little street is Shibuya Yokocho, so Shibuya Alley. You wouldn't know it's here unless you're looking for it. And all these tiny little bars open up at night. There is only about four to six places, four to six stools in each of the bars. So if you're here at night, this might be a nice place to explore. Our shopping now. She's a bad influence. So all I said was I want some Japanese candy and sweets for myself and for my friends. Veronica has brought me to like a five-floor shop 
with everything ranging from cheesecake flavored Kit Kat to virtually the most peculiar candy I've ever seen in my life. I may have gone a little overboard, but in my defense, about half of this is for my friends. Came out of the candy store and it's just after sunset, so we've got about half an hour to go until we go right up over there to the Shibuya sky where we'll get a spectacular view of nighttime Tokyo and you'll see just how big and vast the city really is. Veronica has just led me into this super, super fancy food court. As you can see, it looks properly luxurious and actually it's right above a subway station. Apparently this is what they do here in Japan. For all the big stations, they have food courts and then they have restaurants with readily made meals so that if you're in a rush to get home from work, you can buy a readily made meal or you can do your shopping or have a meeting or something in a fancy food court. So everything is sort of condensed into one place. I've also noticed that the way that they display food is very different to what I've seen back home because everything is actually plastic. So all their display foods are not edible at all. This is in cafes, restaurants, markets, all the display foods look something like this. So I'll be honest with you guys, when I first tried to book Shibuya Sky, I actually wanted to go during sunset because it's the most popular time to go. But I was a day late in booking the tickets, meaning I tried to book it on the 29th day before coming here instead of exactly a month earlier and everything was sold out. Even like 20 minute time slot for sunset was all gone for every single day of my trip to Tokyo. So the only piece of advice I can give you is book way ahead and that goes for everything that goes for observation decks restaurants museums like everything that requires a booking do it three to four weeks ahead at least okay looks like we're here The amazing thing about Shibuya Sky, which I actually didn't really expect, is the amount of space you have. And it's completely 360 and the glass doesn't go up all the way like it does on most observation decks. So you can kind of stand and film or take pictures over it if that's what you want. But look, all of that is Tokyo, all of that is Tokyo, all of that is Tokyo as far as the eye can see. It's really, really mind-blowing and I'm so happy that I got to do this so early on in my trip to Japan because this sets a really high bar for everything else now. The day has started off with a bit of luxury as our Uber showed up and I realized that the Ubers here are a lot fancier overall than the ones in Europe for roughly the same price. So look at this, I'm gonna recline Oh, this is like a proper van as well, it's so spacious. And then have a look at this. I'm getting my uh, leg rest up as well. Ah, so for the 20 minutes that I'm gonna ride to the Asakusa area, I can practically sleep if I wanted to. As I mentioned before, this area is called Asakusa. Best to come here early in the morning. It is known as an entertainment district, even though before it had a historical significance. All these tiny little streets. Paving your way to the main temple is Nakamisadori, one of Japan's oldest shopping streets now known for irresistible food. Why, you ask? Because Japan. Went for a rice cake. It was really nice. It's soft and it's like puff pastry covered in a sweet sauce. It's actually really, really nice and it's warm too. I'm happy with my choice and there was a lot of choice. This was very hard. Through those tiny little streets, we've arrived at the Sensuji Temple, which is a Buddhist temple from the year 645. So it is, in fact, 
the oldest temple here. Super, super grand. A lot of people here. Really well maintained, I have to say. Like, even though it's old, you would expect it to be falling to pieces, but it's really not. They really take care of their history. They preserve the culture and everything that these temples stand for, and I really appreciate that. I felt that walking through the Sensuji temple was equivalent to entering a realm where time stood still, inviting moments of reflection and tranquility amidst the bustling city. This gave me the opportunity to stand back and truly appreciate Japan's rich culture and history for the first time during my trip. The Uber has brought me to Ueno Park, which is a very large public park, first opened in the 19th century. I'm gonna have lunch here with my local friends. They recommended a really nice traditional restaurant. But first, I'd like to point out the first public trash that I have seen here in Japan. If you walk around the streets, you'll notice that not only is it incredibly and impeccably clean, but that there are no trash boxes, no bins, nothing of that sort anywhere. That's because people are actually expected to bring their trash home with them instead of leaving it anywhere on the streets. So that is, I believe, how the city stays so clean. No matter what area you go to, you're not gonna find a single piece of litter on the ground. Well, so far everything has been incredible in Tokyo, except for one little detail. I haven't seen any dogs. Even in the park, I'm looking around and there are no dogs. Why? I think I'm at the right place for the lunch that my local friends recommended, but I can't read anything, so I don't know. This is the first time in a long, long, long while that I'm in a country where I cannot read anything, and uh, it's really unsettling. Yeah, this is definitely traditional, as traditional as it gets, I would say. Right, innocent, right here. That's really cool as well. Ooh. You get like your own private little yeah, room. Yeah. I didn't expect that. I thought it was like a restaurant with low tables um, but that you share with everyone. But this is like a whole new level of traditional, private, and thank you so much. The food looks really good as well, the pictures that I've seen. So I'm gonna take you guys through this very unusual lunch experience. Inshote is a traditional kasake restaurant, meaning that small portions are prepared with local ingredients. I've noticed that the tofu in Japan, in general, tastes completely different to the prepackaged stuff that we buy in Europe. Like it actually has taste here, and the texture is totally different, so I don't think I can ever eat tofu again in Europe. That's it. Japan has ruined tofu for me. Why is the food so good here? The presentation was to die for and every dish had an element of the unexpected. Desserts here, we've got a wine jelly with some fruits. Rice, mochi, and a leaf. Oh my gosh, the texture is super weird. Lunch was good, dessert was questionable. Overall, we recommend, right? Yeah, I think so. Seasonal ingredients, which is different to usual street food over here. Speaking of street food, where are we going now? Akihabara. It was time to try the Tokyo subway. So one of these cards not only gets you on uh, the subways, but you can also use it for vending machine purchases. You can go to the convenience store with it. You can take the bus, so it's not just the subway as a form of public transport. It's a little car that looks like this, and you top it up with actual money, and then you use it every day or as often as you need to. We're here, and we're going down here. You have to be really quiet in these trains. You'll see it's completely silent. Everyone is very respectful of each other's personal space and each other's quiet time. So very different to European trains for sure. Akihabara. Akihabara. 
we've definitely come out in a Kiyabara, but we've just got there in a really dodgy way. This is where they sell electronics, okay. um, things you wouldn't be able to find in regular big department stores. It's all in the dodgy alleyways. Yeah. A Kiyabara in Tokyo is known worldwide as the crazy hub of anime, manga, and electronics. Our first stop had to be one of the countless gaming arcades here. So you've got mirrors and makeup lights so you can make yourself look presentable before the photo booth and then you can edit your face after yep. We need to try this. <laughs> so these they have everywhere. You'll see rows and rows of them so there's about hundreds of them on most of the streets over here in Ikeabara. We've got some anime characters, some animal figurines, pandas. There's even ones where you can buy girls' underwear, apparently. In general, in Ikeabara, you'll find everything. You can find manga, anime, Pokemons. You can find all sorts of different cafes with, you know, like sexy maids serving you. You can even find hug cafes where people will just give you hugs. So whatever comes to your mind, this is probably the place where you'll be able to find it. This right here is a multi-floor kinky ass sex shop apparently. Well, that was uh, interesting to say the least. Now it's getting dark outside, all the lights are starting to come on and I'm gonna go grab a coffee. Uh, before finishing the day and uh, planning tomorrow. Past the coffee place, there's actually a whole Japanese supermarket. I was not expecting this and I'm kind of blown away by how much there is. I don't understand what three quarters of the stuff is, but I'm very, very intrigued. As a local, what would you buy here? So this here is salmon egg, like a pouch of salmon egg inside when you slit it open it it's like a bunch of little balls. And all of these products, like this one here, is mayonnaise. And then inside is a bunch of like little salmon eggs. So this is called a dorayaki. It's really good. Mine's peanut flavor. What's yours? And mine's the black sesame dorayaki. It's oh no! Inside. Okay, it's like a sandwich. Yeah. Oh, I messed up, okay. It's quite nice. Mm. Oh. I wish the filling came out to the edges because the first bite it was, it was all basically red. just the pancake. Yeah. Yeah. If you ask me, Akihabara is a must visit area in Tokyo. But don't do what I did and stay out late and then plan an activity for 5 a.m. the next day. The Toyosu Tuna Auction in Tokyo is a renowned spectacle where massive tunas, prized for their quality and size, are auctioned off to the highest bidders before dawn. Gaining access to the highest viewing deck with a guide requires you to enter an online lottery a few weeks before the auction. Needless to say, I was so happy when we won. The green floors contrast with the red tuna meat, and every fish gives about 700 nigiris. 1,200 tunas get sold here daily, and the auction uses hand symbols for pricing. Super cool experience, definitely something very different. Seeing the amount of tuna fish and just how the process uh, has evolved to become what it is as an auction was really, really cool. A five minute drive away from that fish market, which is the new one, is the original fish market, which is outdoors, a lot more hectic. You can see there's a bunch of people and it's only seven in the morning and I'm actually thinking of getting something to eat here. The Tsukiji fish market was once the largest wholesale fish market in the world. So only trying a few things will be hard. First attempt at local market food is uh, unagi, so eel. Mm. So good. Oh my gosh. It's coated in like a um, sweet sauce, not even a soy sauce. It's really, really, really nice. Just really buttery, melts in your mouth.
corn fish cake. Sounded weird enough to be good. Mm. Sweet corn layer is um, better, I would say, than the inner fish layer for obvious reasons. Okay. That's pretty nice. Not bad. Like a um, 7 out of 10. So what we've got here is a traditional rice cake. It's warm, it's wrapped in seaweed, and inside you can pick a filling. So I asked what the best one was, and he said that it's grilled salmon belly, which is what I've got right here. Next, it's time to explore Ginza, Tokyo's most prestigious shopping area with some of the most expensive commercial real estate in Japan. Here, you'll find sleek skyscrapers, designer stores, fashion-forward boutiques, but also some smaller specialty shops, which is what I've come to discover. Another thing that I noticed in Japan is how silent the construction works are, even in a busy area like Ginza. I later found out this is because the actual construction happens in a confined space elsewhere, and only the assembly occurs on site, also employing a decibel meter to ensure noise is kept to a minimum. Wow, the smell in here is something else. A quick stop in a quirky plant shop and on to my next find. A tiny boutique on a side street entirely dedicated to chopsticks. There are hundreds of them and you can even have them engraved. I had a hard time choosing, so I went for eight separate sets. Top tip, when you're shopping, make sure to bring your passport. It'll get you tax free. If you've worked up an appetite, visit Sushiya in Ginza. This is a Japanese omakase lunch, meaning there's no menu and it's up to the chef to prepare a multi-course tasting menu in front of you based on the day's freshest ingredients. Mix vegetable with a baby sardine salad. This is flounder. Mm -hmm. Flounder is wasabi and soy sauce or wasabi and salt or pon soy sauce. You can choose. This is action and wasabi and soy sauce only. I love Japanese omakases. The only thing that they don't do is desserts. So I found a place called Ginza Kimuraya, which was established by a samurai in the 19th century, and they serve traditional pastries. So I'm gonna go there. It tastes like, um, like a custard donut. <laughs> My cameraman took it away because it was his to begin with. Interesting. Interesting is where this commentary ends. On to the next one. Okay, regular bean. Custard would probably still be my favorite, so my cameraman did a very good job picking that one. The bean paste definitely tastes more local, more unique, I would say, but it's not for everyone. About an eight minute drive from Ginza, you will come to an area called Minato, which I actually had no expectations for because I wasn't even planning on coming here to begin with, so I don't really do that much research. But now that I'm here, I can see that it is absolutely breathtaking. You've got these amazing, perfectly manicured gardens, ponds, huge modern office buildings, and inside them there is everything from, you know, boutiques, cafes, cinemas, offices, shops, exhibitions, everything. And then you've got luxury designer boutiques, green areas for people to sit around when they're on their work breaks. Now, the reason that I've decided to come here is because I really wanted to see the borderless exhibition by Team Labs. And Team Labs is a company that's been doing digital art exhibitions all around the world, but the original one, the most famous one, is definitely here in Japan. You've probably seen pictures all over Instagram with those shiny chandelier style lights. So that's exactly where I'm going. I'm gonna tell you guys if it's worth it or not. And then after that, I'm gonna take you to a completely free observation deck on the 33rd floor on one of these buildings. It's a hidden gem, not a lot of tourists know about it, so I think it'll be really interesting to compare that to the Shibuya sky that we've seen previously in the video, and after that I'm also going to show you a really luxurious place for sunset. Team Lab Borderless was a mesmerizing journey through a surreal landscape of light, sound, and motion, blurring the lines between art and technology. And yes, this is something else I had to buy tickets for three weeks ahead.
pretty much in the same building complex as the borderless exhibition, you've got something called the Sky Lobby. Now, I've shown you a paid observation tower when we went to the Shibuya Sky at night, but this one is actually free and it's amazing for the day just because you get such an amazing view of the most famous telecommunications tower here, which is called the Tokyo Tower. We're getting close to golden hour, but there's still one more thing to show you before the day ends with a spectacular sunset. A really relaxing thing that you can do in central Tokyo is walk around the Imperial Palace. It's got a really wide span of gardens, moats, historical ruins, trees everywhere and Tokyo being such a crowded city this is like a little oasis where no matter how big it is you're always going to find a huge space to yourself and just when I least expected it my first dog sighting in Tokyo which is almost as exciting as this mesmerizing sunset location This is actually inside the Four Seasons Hotel here in Tokyo and they've got this stunning rooftop bar. It took some time for me to find it and to look up the sunset times, organize everything accordingly. But look, it's absolutely perfect. You can come here for drinks or for dinner and let me tell you, this is definitely the most luxurious place that you can watch the sunset from. As it got dark, we decided to head back to Ginza to two places that not many tourists know about. The first being Torishige, a yakitori restaurant that was established almost a hundred years ago. And right next door, Ginza Music Bar. And since I was in the mood to explore nightlife, it was only logic for us to head to Shinjuku next. This neighborhood in Tokyo offers a glimpse into the vibrant pulse of urban Japanese life. Walking through Shinjuku sometimes looks like this. Look, one hand, other hand. Absolute insanity. And here we are. Golden Guy is a famous bar area within Shinjuku and it's really funny because to get there you actually do have to go through the big crowded streets which reminded me of the Shibuya Scramble Crossing a little bit but then you end up in something that's so small and so quaint with the tiniest little bars you've ever seen in your life. I absolutely love the contrast even though I'm not sure I'm actually gonna stay for a drink. They're all so, so, so tiny. Maybe enough to seat six people maximum. It's sort of like that tiny little street we saw near the uh, Shibuya Scramble Crossing. But at night, I think this is a little bit more vibrant and lively. It's Sunday today, by the way, so I'm guessing that Fridays and Saturdays, it gets really, really cramped and busy here. As another late night brought another picture-perfect morning, I realized it was time to say goodbye to Tokyo and continue this journey. Despite this being my first time in the city and my first stop in Japan, I can safely say it exceeded all my expectations and surprised me in so many wonderful ways. I'd even go so far as to say it's my new favorite capital city in the world. Well, today the day starts, unfortunately, with us leaving Tokyo. I just got to the train station. I'm gonna have to say goodbye to Veronica. We are continuing on without her, unfortunately, to a place called Hakone, where we are going to get to using a bullet train. Japan's famous Shinkansen is known to travel up to 320 kilometers an hour. And as the city quickly turned into a lush countryside, we approached Hakone, where I'll be spending one night in a luxurious ryokan. 
just arrived at Odawara station which is the arrival point for our stay in Hakone in case you guys don't know about Hakone it is a mountain retreat really close to Tokyo only about a half an hour train right away and it's right next to Mount Fuji you've got beautiful views and uh, really nice ryokans which is where we're gonna stay it's all very traditional and I think we're gonna have a really great time and something totally different to Tokyo the luxurious Gorakadan retreat assigns a local Japanese assistant to each room during your stay. Welcome to our room in Gorakadan! This is absolutely epic. I'm so excited about this. So when you enter, you've got these Japanese slippers, which I'll try to put on later because I've seen everyone wearing them with socks. Then you go in. Be careful not to bash your head against this. So we're going to have our breakfast and our dinner sitting down at this traditional uh, table on the floor then this area is like a relaxation area with traditional furniture we've got this whole terrace space the feeling that you get here is really really calming you can hear water trickling in the background. The air is really fresh, like mountain air. Let's go see my favorite part of the room, which is actually the bathroom. And one of the reasons that I picked this room and not any other room. My own private onsen in Uriyakan. There's a lot of thermal waters and thermal activity here. So what's really popular to do here is go to one of these uh, like onsen spas but they are not private so all the women can go together you have to be fully naked by the way and then all the men go together in another one one of these rooms uh with the private one can use it whenever so i really like that concept i think for one night it's worth the extra money obviously you have a toilet that is a japanese toilet look at that opens on its own when there is motion detected you've got all sorts of different options here i mean i'll let you read what these are and toilets in Japan are only ever like this. I actually haven't even seen a regular Western one since I got here. The last part of the room that we haven't seen yet is the bedroom. I think it's the most simple part of the room because it's just two mattresses. Um, but I think it's interesting to see because actually here you can choose if you want to sleep on a Western mattress, so like this, or on a tatami bed, which is basically on the floor like they would do traditionally. I picked the soft, fluffy Western mattresses because I do want to get a good night's sleep. But if I'm feeling brave today, I guess this is always an option. If you're an art lover, there's definitely something for you here in Hakone. It's not just ryokans and onsens. There is actually a pretty famous outdoor art museum and sculpture garden that was founded in the 60s. Well, I'm back in my room in Gorakadan. Honestly, I'm a bit obsessed with this hotel and I really, really wish I could have stayed just a little bit longer. I wanted to give you guys a few really valuable Japan tips before I go take my bath in there. And the tip number one would be to fill out your immigration form before you actually get to the airport. That means that you have to log in online and you have to do a questionnaire and give your passport details and the details of your stay in Japan. And then you can just leave the airport using a QR code instead of queuing up like everyone else does. Number two would be to change your money as soon as you get here as a lot of companies or taxis don't actually accept card so having cash on you is pretty vital when you get to Japan and my third tip would be to download an app called Aerolo which gives you data and a virtual eSIM without you having to buy a local SIM card. Here is my yukata that I have managed to put on hopefully the right way after my bath. So how it works is you've got the left side going over the right side and not the other way around because that's how they dress corpses apparently. Then you've got the band which for women is meant to be on the waist and then for men can be slightly lower down and my favorite part socks. These socks are actually meant to be comfortable when wearing their traditional flip-flops. Whilst you're inside, whilst you're on this kind of floor, you're only going to be barefoot or 
wearing socks. A yukata is normally worn to bathhouses, for example, whereas a kimono is considered a more formal piece of clothing here. Bit of a fashion show, and soon it's dinner time. As much as I enjoyed those fish dishes, they are actually not comparable to the omakase that we had in Tokyo, unfortunately, but I also ordered some wagyu beef from their menu. As you can see, it's cooking right in front of me at the moment. This right here, I have a feeling is gonna be the highlight of the dinner. Mm. See, that's the thing about Japan. You expect a country to specialize in either fish or meat, but here both things are equally as good, and if I'm being perfectly honest, they are better than any fish or any meat that I've had anywhere else in the world. The dessert is a cream with strawberry sauce, and what I love about any Japanese dinner is that they'll always serve you green tea, as well as one of these wet towels that comes at the start and at the end of every meal to make sure that your hands are clean. While I've got my traditional pajama on, they gave it to me here right after dinner. Not sure how comfortable it's gonna be, but the fabric is definitely nice and soft, so at least I've got that going for me. I am gonna go sleep now, and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Good morning. I slept quite well, despite the Japanese pajama not being quite as comfortable as I had hoped, but having said that, the mattress on the floor really was comfortable. They've just brought me breakfast and I had a choice between Japanese breakfast and the Western style breakfast. Um, I had a look at the Japanese one and it was just fish, so I went for the safe option. Very excited. I think that this will keep me full for a while, which is a good thing because today we're heading on over to Kyoto. just got to Odawara station. The hotel was an awesome experience, I have to say. Uh, staying there one night, two nights, however long you have time for is definitely worth it. Yes, it is expensive and you do have to book about six months ahead, but if you are organized, trust me, it'll pay off. Now at the station, this is also a really cool experience because uh, you have a bunch of different food options. Here, it's really efficient, really good. Honestly, some of the best noodles I've ever had. You order on the machine and in about 30 seconds you get your food at the counter you can stay there you can eat it and then they clear your plate and basically you're in and out in five minutes eating the best noodles of your life it's absolutely epic and I didn't actually expect this from the train station As the bullet train took me on a three-hour long journey to Japan's historical capital Kyoto I got a glimpse of a cloudy Mount Fuji my arrival in Kyoto was met with a more dynamic energy than Hakone, but definitely not as hectic as Tokyo. In Kyoto, I'll show you how to explore the city like a tourist and a local. But first... When I was in Tokyo, Veronica kept telling me to visit a Japanese 7-Eleven. They are everywhere here, virtually at least one on every street, I would say. And the things in here are very different to the 7-Eleven merchandise that you would find in the US. It's just after 8 a.m. and I am in the Otagi Nenbutsuji Temple. This temple is mostly known for the 1,200 sculptures that represent the disciples of Buddha and each one of them has a different facial expression. The tradition is that you come in here and you try to find a sculpture that resembles your own face. After this, I'm gonna take you on a eight minute walk to a private bamboo forest. The famous bamboo forest is only a short drive away from here, but that gets very crowded very, very early on in the day. So you and I are gonna explore a different option, a more private option, but equally as beautiful. So stick around. I think this is gonna be a really useful tip for when you come to Kyoto. So first you're gonna walk down a road basically with a wall 
covered in greenery and moss on one side. Then you're gonna walk through these traditional streets until you reach that staircase. And that is where you have to go to get to your private bamboo forest. The bamboo grove actually belongs to a temple and a cemetery. What I recommend doing is go for opening time to the Otaginan Mutsuji temple at 8 a.m., spending about 45 minutes there, and then walking down right on time for the 9 a.m. opening here. As you can see, I'm basically alone here. No one has really gotten up this early to come here, and it's a fantastic feeling. Adashino Nembutsuji Temple is a serene sanctuary steeped in history and tranquility. The bamboo grove, only accessible through the temple grounds, gave me the chance to experience the essence of Kyoto's spiritual and natural beauty as I wandered through this magical hidden gem alone. I'm in the taxi now, going to meet my local guide, Shohei, who's going to show us around the Gion district and everything in that area. And I'm also really curious to ask him about life here in Kyoto. Well, my name is Shohei Toyoda. I've been living in Kyoto for 12 years, and it was just a pleasure to meeting Christina. <laughs> Kyoto, we were founded in 794, and it was our capital until 1868. Everything you know about Japan today has its roots in Kyoto. From kimonos, to arts, to culture, to spirituals, religion, architecture. That's the traditional street we just saw. Here is a shrine dedicated to the god of entertainment. And then this street over here is where you'll see some geishas at night. Now, in order to be a part of entertainment given by the geishas, you actually need to be a member of one of these clubs. And in order to be a member, you have to know another member. So it's not like a tourist can walk in and just see geishas doing their thing. It's very much a private members club. The word geisha literally means artists. They perform right in front of you in a very private setting. They start at age 15 and their start, first start as a dancer. We call them Maikos, by the way. So let's say someone is a member at a geisha club. They're obviously very wealthy. What does a wealthy person do in Kyoto? CEO of some company. Lots of old companies, for example, kimono stores. In the newer side, a lot of chemical companies are here. A lot of pharmaceutics are here. Oh, the big one, Nintendo is from Kyoto. Oh, that's right, Nintendo. We all know Nintendo. Mm -hmm. Next is the Yasaka Shrine. That roof is layers and layers of tree bark, by the way. In general, there's a lot of orange colors here, which contrast so beautifully with the greenery you'll see this time of year. This is one of the oldest shrines in Kyoto, because this is older than the city. It's actually made in mid 700s. In the shrines, we worship a lot of our Shinto gods. In the main altar here, we worship the God of the Guardian. Now, a walk through the historical streets leading up to the main temple that I've been dying to get a glimpse of. Really nice, this street doesn't have any uh, poles or any wires through it either. So that's been a really good thing to see in some of these streets because what I'm used to here in Japan is everything looking meticulous, but then as soon as you get onto a big street, it's full of wires and poles as soon as you look up. And even though these streets are packed with shopping opportunities, I asked Shohei to take me to a local tea house. Okay, so this you said was a rice cake with soy glaze sauce. Which is very sweet with some soy sugar powder. Mm. I'm not sharing this with you. I hope you know. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> it was really, really good. <laughs> a lot more bitter than the stuff we get in Europe because mm. this is real matcha. 
or you're really like high class Kyoto citizen if you live close to the palace. All these traditional areas we're just walking, like I literally don't know anyone that lives here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice dream, it's but a nice it's not dream. reality. Yeah, 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 probably. They've been passed down through generations and generations. Yeah. They're, I've never seen it on sale. You said that you prefer living here to the United States. Oh, 100%. No Why offense, folks. No offense. 100%. <laughs> Why is that? Why do you prefer it here? <laughs> the value of everything here is very high, high standard. And the service is very high standard. Oh, the social services too, universal health care. Yeah. The roads are clean. Everything is clean here. Coming to you from under the umbrella, we didn't get very lucky with the weather as we're approaching the main temple. But tell us about it anyway. This is the Kiyomizu Temple, one of our 17 World UNESCO Heritage Sites we have in Kyoto. And this is safe to say the most popular temple in Japan. Everyone comes here once in a lifetime, more than 1300 years old. But also the main hall is one of the biggest wooden complexes in the world, held by 139 wooden poles. So we're walking back under the rain and the street is even more crowded than it was before. And I was just asking Shohei what the criminality here is like. He said that there are some burg burglars. I can't say it, can I you? can't say either. There's some people stealing money, uh, you know, just... Uh, stealing money, you guys get the word that we can't pronounce. Despite the fact that our society is very organized, very safe, very clean, there's a pressure to maintain that which is a very uh, mental pressure for us, the citizens. We gotta act in this own way. Uh, Japan has the most number of mental hospitals in the world. You know, that is a sign. I said bye to Shohei and headed over to the other side of Kyoto for my next activity, where I'll be learning more about the drink I've been having with every meal in Japan so far, sake. Sake is made from various types of rice, which is polished to different degrees before molding, fermenting, and filtering. Sake can range from dry to sweet, with classifications like Junmai, Ginjo, and Dai Ginjo. Needless to say, I liked some varieties more than others. Hey, I'm not gonna lie, I did get a little bit tipsy during that sake tasting. There was just so much sake. Oh, I don't know how everyone drank everything. I was about a quarter of the way through and already my head started getting a little bit dizzy. Anyway, ahead of us we've got a food market, uh, so that's where I'm headed now. I'm hoping to find some nice traditional lunch to eat and uh, yeah, I think that's all that I can say without, you know, falling flat on my face. <laughs> Well, I found a chicken katsu restaurant, which is great because chicken katsu isn't something that I've had here since my arrival to Japan. This restaurant is really local. It's a concept where you actually split the table with other people and you're separated by a glass divider. Let's give this a try. Crispy on the outside and soft on the inside. Absolutely perfect. And they also serve it to you with some rice, miso soup, some tofu. So that's always something that's complimentary with meals over here. Trying out the Kyoto subway. I got in using my Suica card, which is the same one that I used in Tokyo. I have a feeling that it's going to be just as meticulous and organized and timely. So let's see if I'm right. Earlier today, whilst drinking traditional matcha with Shohei, I became curious to find out more about tea ceremonies in Japan. In a matcha ceremony, the main aim is to appreciate a fleeting moment of togetherness with your company. The guests first watch as the host meticulously cleans and purifies the tea utensils and prepares the tea in front of them, followed by a small Japanese dessert and then the matcha itself. It's important for the guests to rotate their cups so that the main part of the design faces outwards towards the host as a sign of respect. Yeah. 
you guys won't believe this but earlier today it was snowing here i looked out the window when i woke up at about 6 30 a.m and sure enough there was snow falling on the rooftops but i also saw some sunshine so i took the opportunity and i went out bright and early to the fushimi inari shrine this shrine is probably the most photographed one in japan it's basically 10,000 orange structures first dedicated to the god of rice which was also their form of currency back in the day so it's like dedicated to the god of business and then over time worshippers donated more and more of the structures and then businesses had their names engraved on it too the color orange is for good luck and to repel bad spirits and it is quite a while to hike up to the top but i think it's going to be worth it so i'm going to do as much as i can before heading over to the next activity you are going to see these foxes everywhere throughout the trail and we talked about how all of these gates are to honor the rice god and these foxes right here are actually the messengers of the rice god. They're said to be cunning and witty and sly, but the perfect messengers. Well, I guess that's that. Traffic is being diverted about halfway through because of a fallen tree. So that is my hike done. I guess normally it takes anywhere from 40 minutes up to two and a half hours to hike all the way to the top. But I've had to stop at about 20 minutes because of tree. This was nice, but I wish I'd come about two hours earlier. It's open 24-7, by the way, so you can integrate it into any part of your day. By night, it's apparently quite nice as well. Although with the sunlight, you are going to get more of the bright orange colors. The next activity is actually a very special train going to a new location yet again. This train might even be cooler than the bullet train I took to come to Kyoto. It is called the luxury sightseeing train from the 60s and 70s and it takes you from Kyoto to Nara which is the famous wild deer park here. I think you're going to want to see this train and if you want to book it make sure you do so about three to four weeks ahead. I actually got the last two remaining seats on this one and I'm so 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 happy because because this is an experience like no other. This is another seating option. I still think that whatever seat you book, you're still getting quite a treat. It's absolutely amazing. Such a cool experience being on a train like this and then comparing it to the Shinkansen. Nara Deer Park, which was first established in 1880, is renowned for its 1,400 sacred deer, believed to be messengers of the gods in Japanese mythology. It looks like there's some sort of courting or bathing ritual going on behind me. Some deer are definitely braver than others here. I have arrived at Todeji Temple, one of the largest wooden structures on the planet. Basically, it was the largest one up until 1998. And this temple actually dates back from the 8th century. It's a Buddhist temple. Well, as you can see, the line to go inside kind of resembles the line for the donuts in Tokyo. Don't judge, but I'm actually getting hungry, so I'm gonna head over and get some food. Well, I have unfortunately finished all my deer cookies. What I was thinking was how much I missed animal contact when I was in Tokyo and Kyoto. There's very few animals around there. I mean, even dogs I don't really see. And just like that lack of wildlife really got to me after about a week. I think that's one of the reasons that I've enjoyed my time here so far. And now I think it's time for me to get some food because watching them eating all my cookies has worked up an appetite for me. La Tejas restaurant in Nara is known for its Michelin star status and captivates diners with exquisite French cuisine and impeccable presentation using local ingredients. Even though the dishes are small, they make up for it in quantity and exceptional flavors. The deer of Nara are wild animals. They can occasionally attack people. Please be careful. Bite. Kick. Butt. Knockdown. I decided to take my chances. And it was going great, until it wasn't. Okay. Hey, no! 
<laughs> that was really scary for a minute. One of them bit my leggings. One of them basically wiped his face on my sweater. One of them bit the other's butt and there's a chunk of fur in his mouth. Yeah, they get aggressive over to the side. Oh, this one looks so sweet though. I can't say no to this one. Hello. Hello. Oh, this one's like Bambi. So we have a deer now? We have a deer now. Yes, it appears that we have a deer now. My pet deer soon left me in search of snacks elsewhere. So off I went with a bruised ego and a broken heart to explore Isuen Gardens, a meticulously crafted masterpiece from the Edo period, right in the center of Nara. Isuen Garden is actually the only traditional walking garden here in the Nara area. It costs about a thousand yen to get in, but you'll see it's a lot bigger than it looks on the map and there's just so much to see here. It's really relaxing. The nature is absolutely beautiful. The sounds, the smells, the sights in this park are really worth seeing if you're in Nara. This is almost as scary as back there. At least these aren't violent. They're not gonna headbutt me and bite my leggings off. I was wrong yet again. They gave me a rose at the restaurant. So cute. The amazing thing about Nara is that it's so walkable. You don't actually need a car once you're in Nara to get from attraction to attraction. There's deer everywhere, so please don't think that that little area outside the station is the only place where you'll see them. I find that the deer closer to the inner area of the parks are a lot more wild and it's kind of more interesting to interact with them. But now we are going to see another shrine, which I think is gonna be a little bit less crowded than the main one. This shrine is called the Kasuga Teisha Shrine. It's a world heritage site that's from the eighth century. Orange gates again, just like we saw in Fushimi Nari in Kyoto, now we know what they mean. Wow, this place, it's kind of like Alice in Wonderland mixed with something even more whimsical. I can't quite put my finger on it, but I think this shrine I definitely prefer to uh, the central temple that we saw earlier. This part of Nara feels almost surreal. I have to say it's like you're in some sort of, I don't know, CGI'd movie almost. Like all of these deer are just so perfect and blend into the woods so well. It's really hard to describe if I'm being perfectly honest. I think that when you step off the train, I see a bunch of tourists, a bunch of vendors for cookies, uh, like this big, big crowded space. You're like, oof, is this really all it is? And then you go deeper and deeper and you start exploring Nara for more than just that part outside of the train station. And you come to realize that actually it's really, really magical. I feel like I'm in a storybook now. There's one more stop in Nara before I head back to the train station. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you guys for being here. I really, really enjoy making these videos for you. So if you found it useful and valuable for your next trip to Japan, please hit the subscribe button. Please interact with this video. And also if you want to follow my travels in real time, I interact a lot through Instagram stories. So be sure to follow me on there as well. It's at Christina Hauer. Main Street of Nara. That is where they make the famous mochis with the demonstration of the guy actually like beating the mochi, by the way. I missed the one for today because we were still having lunch. But if that's something that you're interested in, then when you get to Nara, just go there and check what time they'll be doing that and then you can always come back. Oreo Japanese Mecca home. On a scale of one to 10, if you like sugar being your only ingredient, it's definitely a 10. 
Surprisingly enough, my day in Nara ended up being one of my favorite days in Japan. And now, on to the next stop. Welcome to Osaka! I just got out of the train station. My taxi is right here. I'll show you guys a little bit about Osaka and what makes it so special. I'm sure that we'll make the most of it. What I've noticed in Japan is that you never have to open your own taxi door. Either the driver does it for you or the door opens automatically using a button next to the driver's seat. And did I mention the overly expressive ads on the screens inside taxis? But that's clearly not enough entertainment. So what I'm about to show you is Osaka's main entertainment district itself. Itself, Dotonbori. Well, we're starting in probably the most famous part of this area, which is the canals. Obviously, entertainment, neon lights everywhere, bright colors, similar to Akihabara in Tokyo that we saw earlier on in the video. But here you've got a water element added to it as well. I can't believe how many of these there are in Japan. Covered shopping arcades everywhere in Tokyo, Kyoto, here. I think it's part of Japanese culture at this point. But past the arcades, you'll also find Hozenji Temple from the 17th century and home to a famous moss statue. Going for dinner to a katsu place today, meaning that it'll be like deep fried vegetables, fish, meat. And the only reason that I know where it is is because I've looked at a bunch of Google reviews. So you get to the address and then you have to go down the stairs through a corridor and it's the second restaurant that has no English signs whatsoever. So basically you won't know that it's there unless that is specifically where you're going to. And I'm hoping that the food is gonna be good as well. So let's find out. Well, no visit to Osaka is complete without visiting Osaka Castle. This is probably one of the most famous landmarks in Japan, if not the most visited castle in Japan from the 17th century. And if you think that it's just one castle, you are very wrong. That's what I thought and I came here only to realize that it is in fact a huge structure built using over half a million large stones. Standing at 170 meters tall is this huge work of art called the Umeda Sky Building. On the top floor, you have an observation deck where you can see Osaka from above. Unfortunately, the weather isn't quite looking perfect because it's really cloudy today. But nevertheless, I decided to come anyway because it's my only day here in Osaka. Tickets can be found online. And yeah, I can't stop looking up. It is pretty amazing, even from here. I've gone up one floor to the skywalk, which is basically all outdoors. You can do the perimeter of the terrace with everything right beneath you. The only thing is it is so cold, so, 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 so cold. But that's just my luck with the weather. <laughs> Before I left Osaka, I absolutely had to get Rikuro's famous cheesecake. Super creamy, fluffy cheesecake that they make on the spot there. They've been making for approximately 40 years now. If you go there and you see a huge line, don't be put off by it because actually it's really organized and the line goes really fast. One of these will set you back approximately $7, but what you are getting is actually a full cake. So have a look at this. Ooh, <gasps> look at that. Very, very light. I am not getting much cheese in it, if I'm being perfectly honest. It's more like whipped eggs. This would go really well with Nutella, chocolate sauce, or jam. I'm actually thinking of calling the hotel now and asking if they have some of that stuff. So if you want a local dessert here, this would be the perfect option. And it is unfortunately the last breakfast that I'm gonna have here in Japan because after this, I have to pack my bags and head over to the airport. 
So if you have watched up until now, thank you so much and I really, really, really appreciate you. I hope that this video has been useful for you and I highly recommend you go down into the description because there are a few other points that I didn't mention in this video. This whole trip has just been incredible, amazing, like my mind has been blown. I know that I will be coming back to Japan and I think when you visit, if you use my itinerary, you will also feel the same way. So feel free to reach out to me if there's anything that I haven't covered that you want to know more about. Thank you for being here. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and check out this video next.